Hello and welcome back to the show. This is Anita Black Show. And we specifically <laughs> waited to put up the information for the new series because we wanted to make sure we had time to uh, finish the discussions about our current series. And sure enough, <laughs> it doesn't really matter because um, the discussion groups have already started talking about the new series. But as we told them, we are not going to get into that yet. We are going to uh, wrap up our current series, which is How Whites Promote Mental Illness, Part 7. And today we're going to talk about how black entertainers promote mental illness. You know that when I am uh, speaking of black entertainers, and the show gets a little lively, um, because I do have a lot of uh, problems with the way that entertainers have allowed themselves to be used uh, you know, by the industry. And it really should be, uh, should not be that easy to um, trick black folks into doing things that are counterproductive. <clears throat> so uh, let's start you out like we normally do with a poem. Uh, we gave you the black uh, men's poem, the black women's poem, and the black offspring's poem. And so now we're going to give you the black entertainer's version of what kind of mixed up species. What kind of mixed up species would turn away from their own? What kind of mixed up species would show the disrespect they've shown? What would make people like this give whites the upper hand, hand black children to their enemies, and sell out to gay white men? break the spirit of their people, lead black men straight into jail, show black women as white men's concubines, good only for shaking tails, promote the progress of their enemies, and promote the downfall of their own until they become some used up has-beens, walking this world drunk, drugged, and stoned. How could they sell their rich black heritage to become buffoons to amuse the whites, pushing fantasy and false belief with those who took their people's lives? What could whites have done to them to make them bend and fold? What did the devil promise them to make them sell their souls? The Creator said, don't worry, though my enemy seems large. My enemy uses trickery, but I am still in charge. Though so some black entertainers sold their souls to him, and now their spirits lack, I send a thousand angels here to get black entertainers back. That's a Black Panther poem by Nita Black, and that is called What Kind of Mixed Up Species Black Entertainers. Now, I had a little uh, request, so I'm going to see if I can find it again because uh, they wanted to know uh, there was one we did at the, uh, in the last series for entertainers, and uh, we got a request for me to do it today. Somebody wanted someone to hear it. So I'm going to see if I can find it. Um, in the meantime, oh, I believe it should be. Uh, right here, aha, mm -hmm. and it's called, How Did They Make You Become a Sambo? How did whites get you to become a sambo from a black actor that was good? How did they get you to play a bad cop and play a gangster in the hood? How did whites get you to become a sambo, counting white men as your friends? How did they get you to act like idiots? calling your black people some ends. How do whites get you to become a sambo while all of your white slave masters laugh? To see black men dressed up like women with little black children in their path. How did whites get you to become a sambo? You live to follow a rubber ball. Black men in the past did it for the Negro leagues. 
but now white men just own you all. What if you hadn't become a Sambo, spending your money to be like whites? Can you imagine all the good you could have done if you had put your money towards the fight? Who knows, one day you might wake up and decide to make it right and be that hero you were meant to be and begin to save black children's lives. In the meantime, we'll keep keeping on, though our resources may be feeble. One day you may decide to join in, till then all power to the people. And that is a Black Panther poem from Nita Black as well. Okay, so let's get into the show and how black entertainers um, promote mental illness. We know that uh, since black entertainers have been able to be in entertainment, they have excuse me, been required to promote black inferiority. But you now have excuse me, a huge amount of black entertainers that uh, not only promote that black inferiority that they're, they're expected to um, and paid to promote, but you have a huge amount of entertainers you know, sports celebrities and whatnot that promote white supremacy and they do it. Um, we had a, a comment about the uh, example I gave yesterday of Oprah Winfrey spending, you know, the past 20 odd years um, promoting white supremacy more than any other black person uh, in, in entertainment history. Um, the only person that even came close uh, to promoting white supremacy, um, even though he tried his best to also promote, uh, you know, um, black heritage and all that good stuff, <clears throat> he was paid, one of the higher paid actor, actors of the time, um, he was paid to uh, promote white supremacy. And um, in exchange for that, he was able to uh, do some things that other black actors uh, at the time may have not been able to do. But I'm talking about uh, Paul Robeson. And while blacks have this uh, um, sort of romantic um, image of him and what he accomplished. And like I say, he did try to infuse some history and different things in there. But for the, the most part, <clears throat> he promoted white supremacy. He promoted the white man as, uh, you know, the, the, um, the not so bad. And in the process, he was paid, you know, quite a sum to uh, be the big black buck that uh, took on certain aspects, but uh, of you know, during the whole um, uh, civil not civil rights, but the whole uh, black movement into the television and entertainment industry, into the film industry, and. Uh, you know, he was the spokesperson for, or at least tried to be a spokesperson for the black virile male. But he, it, it came off in a lot of times, and when people talk about how great he was, yes, he was great as an actor, but and and the image of a black man and the images that he portrayed in the movies. Um, when it came to his interactions with whites, that left a lot to be desired. So when you hear people talking about all of the good parts and none of the bad parts, um, either they are reminiscing about the parts that they remember and have not watched it in some time, or it's someone that's just going by what they heard or read and they have not watched it at all. <clears throat> and so what we have them do is we point out certain uh, films for them to watch 
from beginning to end. And they come back and they're like, wow, I had no idea. And, you know, you got the same thing with uh, black females today. They have been very, very loyal to uh, watchers of Oprah, even once um, a, a few years back. They um, were talking about doing a show for uh, some cultural uh, black um women in entertainment or whatnot. Anyway, but there was this discussion about a group of black women that would, um, they were looking for some kind of show ideas or something. And a couple of the cultural black women uh, in the area that I was in at the time wanted to submit a, a show about positive black women too. Um, the Oprah Winfrey show, and I had to let them know, you know, that that um, it's not very many black people that actually get to everyday black people that are a part of the show. That it, um, I know I have not watched her show, and I had to tell her, her producer, uh, people that back in the day, I have not watched her show since it became for whites only. And at, that caused a huge uh, discussion in that they wanted to know, you know, why I said that. Why would I say that Oprah's show is for whites only? But that is what it is. We monitored her show for uh, an entire year in 2002. And of all the shows she did, um, she promoted white products, she promoted white books, white authors, she, um, she put white people, um, you know, let them springboard from her show and to get in their own show. She did, she had talked about her, her white uh, chef, her, she had all these different things, her, she did a show uh, one time about her favorite things, and she gave audience her audience um, her favorite things. And so a black person sent me the episode to show me that, um, you know, she does all this good stuff. And so I had to actually, I, I, I showed the episode to um, the same person that sent it to me, and I had them sit down and tell me, write down on a piece of paper. I had them get a pen and paper. As they were watching the episode on the computer, I had them tell me how many products in that show were black-made products. How many black people in the show did they see her promote? And it was very um, upsetting to them because they were staunch supporters and they believed that uh, she was positive for black women. And so that was kind of an eye-opener for them. Um, you have different um, things. I talked about the uh, situation with uh, the young lady that's trying to be Oprah, Tyra Banks, and coming out in the, with fishnet stockings on her, on her face and, you know, the, looking like a spider web <clears throat> on her face. And, you know, the whole goth look. And it was, you know, one of those things where you just know that if you are looking for positive black female uh, images for young 13-year-old, 14-year-old black female uh, young girls, these are not the people that I would put on the list. So um, just understanding that the black entertainers have spent their time in, in the chase for the paper dollar. They have been willing to do uh, all of these things that were detrimental to the black female image or the black male image. And uh, to hear people, you know, still see them they talked about, well, Oprah, she did a, a school in Africa. And for the amount she paid for that one school, she could have built 10 schools here. Um, you know, she 
went to a place where yes, the the females need to to um, learn, but she did what so many women that have gotten hooked up with white feminist women, white um, lesbian women, all kind of um, different uh, organizations that promote women, 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 and they superseded to a, a, on a disrespectful level. In some cases, they superseded the male um, uh, politicians, the male uh, leaders of those countries, and it just made white people able to use that uh, male, black male, black female uh, animosity against black people. And so she was seen as a, uh, a black tourist, a uh, black celebrity coming to that country um, using her money like whites use their money in Africa to supersede tradition, to supersede authority, and to do what they want to do. And so, you know, it's, it's, I know that black people have their very uh, serious loyalty to some of the different entertainers, but as I told you, these series are going to make you deal with things that you normally uh, don't deal with, that you normally uh, pretend are not there, or, you know, black communities have for the past 60 years been doing the ostrich thing, and Every time you have to talk about something that is uh, detrimental or not good for the black community, you got people that stick their head down in the sand. But what that does is that leaves their behind, stick it up in the air. And it ends up getting kicked over and over again. And so we're going to have to lift our head up and actually start dealing with some of these things that we know um, the black community did not get this way overnight. There had to be something that was promoted, that was uh, supported. Um, we had to to get this um, these things to this point in order for it to get this bad. So in order for to, for it to correct, of course, you are going to have to look very honestly, very seriously at what you promote and what you support. So now, we've got a um, couple of uh, people that sent me a thing saying, well, what about Jada and Will Smith? And of course, I have to always correct them and say Will and Jada Smith, because women, when they call me, tend to put the woman first. <laughs> And you know, like that's fine if you're going through a door, but I want black children to get back used to hearing the daddy and mommy, and they for years have um, that's been flipped on them, and they hear mommy and daddy, which puts mommy at the head, and um, that has is also one of those things that has really caused a lot of problems in the black community because daddy doesn't have that respect that he used to have. And men have a lot uh, to do with that loss of respect. But we're about fixing this, which means men are going to have to get their stuff together, and women are going to have to um, start changing the things that they allow children to believe. So now, uh, you got Will and Jada Smith. And someone sent me a thing saying that in some article, in some interview, um, they said that uh, Hollywood is not is no longer about racism. That the only color in Hollywood now is green, and so <laughs> they wanted to know what I thought of that. Well, of course, that's one of those. If that's true, you know that that article did occur. I couldn't um, say that it did because I'm going by what they sent me, but. If that is true, then they did say that. Well, then I was told the person, you know that that would have to be an illusion because if you look at 10 different movies, including Will Smith's movies, you see that he is the token Negro in most of his movies. So you can have a movie like... Uh, 
um, uh, men in black, where you have all of these different white major characters, yet when it comes, you know, you got to have the white male and the white female. You, they, you, you got to have, you know, the white villain or whatever. But when it comes to black, you have that one, give me one black person to, so that black people will come and watch the movie. And so, you know, you look at uh, Wild Wild West, um, where you had all of these different black, I mean, different white actors and actresses, that then these all get paid quite well, um, from extras to the main characters. But in order for uh, black males, and black females, in order for them to uh, get that fame and notoriety that they're seeking, they um, are pitted against other uh, the blacks for the part. And there's usually only one part and maybe a sidekick uh, part for that where the directors and producers are looking for a Negro character. And so you may have um, 100 uh, different black people show up to audition. You may have another 100 uh, major uh, black entertainers. Um, you know, their agents uh, give their, um, tell their interest that they want to audition. And so they're, they're set up for audition. And so you got 200 black people that are auditioning for these parts. And you're only going to choose one Negro character. And you have eight white characters in a film. And you had um, a thing. Or if there's a large number of casts that make up the major characters, like you had uh, a movie called Ocean Eleven. And in Ocean Eleven, you had all of these white uh you had a white Asian and white uh, Jew and a white, um, one of them I think was German, these two brothers, and you know, all these white characters. And so in this particular case, you had the, um, the, the two Negro characters, and one was the, uh, basically the smart Negro and the other one was more of a sidekick. And Bernie Mac played more of a sidekick uh, type Negro in that his uh, job in the movie was to, um, as a con person, uh, card shark, you know, all the hustler type stuff. And then you had a, a Negro with a, a British accent, and he was considered to be the smart Negro. And, you know, you just look at these different movies. In uh, Transformer, you had a, uh, a cast of white um, characters. And then I know I, I, one of the things that made me mad, people, I, I showed the film to show black people the destruction, the willful destruction that white folks had um, in disrespect they had for the pyramids, um, <clears throat> the damage that was done in the movie to the pyramid, and supposedly the damage was done by these robots. But the fact that um, they would not do that to, uh, you know, another um, cultural uh, icon or cultural um, place, you know, you, you see a lot of different, um, a lot of different uh, images now where people are more, getting more and more disrespectful of places that cultures think of as being sacred. But in the desert scene where they were, um, there, I think the little robots were shooting or, or um, missiles were going off or something. You had the only character that said something negative about 
the place that they were in Africa was the Negro character. And he said it was a God forsaken place and he was ready to, you know, to get out of this God forsaken place or what he's doing what is he, what is he doing in this God forsaken place. But it's the kind of thing that, you know, why would this lie be given to a Negro person? You would think that that particular character would be given a line that shows, um, you know, how he always wanted to go to Africa and see what's what. But, of course, the line that was put in, um, there was a negative derogatory line, and it was given to this token Negro character. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, black actors see in Hollywood that they try to make excuses for and pretend that, you know, they're not what they, what they are. But the question becomes, do they have the backbone to actually demand better? And that's the, the test of your character and what you're willing to promote in order to get along, what you're willing to promote in order to get a part. And so when they read the, um, the different scripts, for example, we talked about how um, Queen Latifah would have had to have read the script for uh, Set It Off. And the reason you had so many Negro characters in Set It Off is because, of course, it's about uh, these um, neighborhood uh, black women that were cleaning people, and now they're thinking about, you know, robbing a bank. And so, you know, it became a thing of, of course, it's, it's not going to turn out well. <laughs> you knew that part from the beginning. But uh, she had to read the script to see. And I like to say, I don't believe that the lesbian scene in there was there initially. It may have been, but it, it appears to be something that was so out of place in the, the movie that it would have had to have been inserted in there by uh, some producer or director that felt that that should be in there uh, for whatever reason. Um, you have, uh, I know, the situation with um, a movie that was sent to me. Because there's a discussion group that critiques uh, Negro movies and see how they are a detriment or a positive to the black community and to black children. And one of the movies that they discussed was uh, another Will Smith movie called uh, I Am Legend. And... And this one, <clears throat> of course, he's got all these white mannequins, and he is the token Negro that is alive. But, you know, he's even the token Negro among the demons that are, are the infected people that are out there, all these white infected uh, zombie-like people. And so you have this movie that could have been a very good movie, except for the fact that it showed exactly what Hollywood thinks of the black people, that in these futuristic movies and um, the disaster movies, they don't expect black people to survive. They don't expect black people to be there in the future in, you know, space and different places. So these movies are done... Uh, for whites only uh, with a simple token, token Negro. But as the movie goes through, and he's, um, you know, he has the little dog thing, and uh, he has to kill the dog. But anyway, he is saved at the end by a white Hispanic woman and her white Hispanic child. And you just think that, you know, he's sending out this SOS, what is the harm in him saying, well, you know, ain't no black women out there to, to save me. Ain't no black women out there to help me, you know. 
why does he feel that he has to accept a role where uh, there are no black females in the role past the initial part where his uh, wife and daughter get on to the plane. And even then, you're talking about a woman that is ambiguously black. And you have all of these different uh, entertainers. Um, if it's a black female entertainer, she is usually with you know, it's not so bad with the women. Not that much, and if you find a um, a caramel color uh, black woman, she will be with a a black male in the movie that is pretty much um, close to her complexion. But what you're seeing over the past ten years is this huge push for black males, dark black males, and um, you know, dark-skinned black males that seem to be uh, that seem to be uh, mated or uh, partnered with white or black white women, and even when you see them, you know, with supposedly a black woman, it's always a a high yellow black woman or someone where when you're looking at them you're seeing a dark man that does not want a dark woman. Or was, you know, when he saw the different people auditioning, did he think for one second that, you know, I'm a pretty good-looking uh, dark chocolate man. Let me find a pretty good-looking dark chocolate woman. And so you just see them promoting um, you know why whites are doing it. You, they're pushing this whole, um, it, she's only beautiful if she's light-skinned or, or white. But the fact that black males go along with it and support it and promote it is definitely uh, detrimental. And what you found over the years is that now darker-skinned black women have been all but shut out of, uh, Hollywood, unless they're playing a single mom or, you know, some drug addict or, you know, somebody in some police show, you know, it's become a thing that uh, both the black males and black females in entertainment are promoting um, this image of black uh, females not being good enough for black males. And you're seeing over the past year or two that same uh, push is being done by white uh, advertising companies, white film companies that are pushing the same thing for black women. They're now being pushed toward uh, white men or light-skinned uh, black men. And in one of the discussions they talked about uh, a couple of years ago, um, there was a rumor that uh, uh, Serena Williams said she didn't uh, like dating black men. Uh, this is a woman that is a, a chocolate-colored woman. Um, she has a she's a little lighter than her sister, but not much. Um, so you have these two uh, darker-skinned women, and they. Um, we're making this big production a couple of years ago about her not liking a man her own color. And so, you know, she only dates uh, white males. And so, of course, um, there were things that where, she, where she denied it. But now you have uh, people sending me um, things about her, her boyfriend, which uh, appears to be a white person, a white male. And so you see her and her sister, and they're, um, I mean, they've pretty much completely turned her sister out. Now, this was a, a black woman that uh, she, she has a lot of talent, and, um, you know, she has, uh, um, you know, aspirations to have a clothing line. <clears throat> and she had the opportunity to really... Uh, her and her sister Serena be a role model for black girls. That's what they started out 
saying that they wanted to be. <clears throat> Excuse me. And somewhere along the way in her chase for acceptance from a white people, they have pretty much turned her into a complete prostitute. And this was one of the saddest things to see because you know that no matter what she does, they're just going to rip her apart in the media, in uh, newspapers and whatnot. But the only time they actually seem to give her any kind of credit or anything is when she is doing something that promotes uh, herself as being, you know, some kind of woman of the night. They made this big production about a uh, outfit she, she made that was burlesque. Now, this is an outfit that normally a, a person wouldn't even leave out of their bedroom wearing. It's something that you wear for your man, for, you know, who, on a, you know, in a romantic night or whatnot. This is not something that a respectable person a respectable black person would wear on a tennis court. And they, to read some of the, uh, the reviews of it, um, and the bloggers were harsh. They were just absolutely harsh. But the, to, see these, uh, to see these French um, reporters and uh, magazines and whatnot, I mean, magazines promoting all kinds of uh, perversions and whatnot, talking about how wonderful she looked on a tennis court in her lingerie was just let you know that they are, there's something wrong with them, first of all, and they're pushing her to be as perverted as them, and it unfortunately um, is working because she, she was falling for it. I remember when her sister, Serena, first started uh, getting into because you know, Venus was in it first, and then um, it, Serena started uh, doing pretty well. And you, you saw they look so cute with their little outfits and whatnot, and it did not take a year before whites had completely turned Serena out. And the next thing that you saw was uh, you saw her in these uh, short shorts that showed half of her butt. And you're like, how did you go from being a role model for young black girls to this? What happened? What was the mentality? You think of uh, um, movies like Mahogany where Diana Ross, who is also one of the black entertainers that lost her mind and decided that black men wasn't good enough for her, but um, you have a mahogany where she is thrown into this white world and suddenly um, she's willing to do anything to please these white people. And she, uh, she ends up at these, this party and she's going to these parties with this white guy, and she's doing all kinds of things that she normally would not do. She's, um, they have her putting uh, candle wax over her body, and she's you know, running around naked and all this list of stuff. And what she wanted to be was a designer. And, uh, you know, that in the movie she was in love with a black male that... She kept getting mad at for whatever reason. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> but um, you see the same thing happening with uh, Venus and Serena. And, you know, it's this last thing that they sent me about a outfit that Venus had worn onto the court. And she, could, she couldn't even concentrate on her game because, I mean, she ended up winning, but the, just to see her like a woman on the streets in Vegas or, you know, somewhere having to keep pulling down her, her this little bitty tiny 
dress uh, that keeps riding up and showing her her underwear. You're like, this is the kind of stuff that you try to wear out and somebody, uh, your mother or grandmother tells you, uh, I know you're not going to go out in that. You must be done lost your ever-loving mind. Now, get in there and put on some clothes. And, you know, this is something that um, you got her father, who when they first started out, it seemed like he really wanted to, um, you know, to show them as little ladies and, you know, role models for young black girls. And somewhere along the way, in hanging with white folks and being infected mentally by white folks, you saw their whole family would have had to have lost their mind or somebody would have the guts to say to her, you are better than this. Do not get caught up in this hype. This is a job. You may be getting paid very well, but this is still a job. And as Tiger Woods is now uh, realizing, when white folks, if they didn't like you when you started, they don't like you now. It just means that they're, you're, as long as you're making the money, they're, they pretend that you're okay. But he's finding out that once you're used up, now you know white folks that can, you know, have a career all the way until they, you know, 137. But as a Negro, once you have been used up like a Negro slave, until you can't be used anymore, you just you just just shrivel up. They then just toss you like yesterday's trash, and they are really really uh, showing him that he is now to them just a, a old newspaper, a old uh, tore tore up worn out shoe. And so he sees the writing on the wall. He sees it coming that he is you know the whole has-been uh, situation, which really didn't have to turn out that way because there have been some very good uh, black golfers that kept their dignity, kept their self-respect, and kept their blackness. They may not have been golden boys in white society, but they were able to keep their dignity and their self-respect. And... Tiger Woods just does not fall into that category. He was willing to give up everything that he was. He was willing to, you know, he spent so much time denouncing his blackness and trying to be something that, you know, other than black, that he never uh, got, he never took advantage of the opportunity to really uh, promote the image of a black male as being someone to be respected, being someone that is skilled and uh, deserving of, you know, the accolades that he was getting. He always bowed down um, trying to be you know, accepted by whites. When, when he first started, he had... Uh, quite a bit of adulation and pride from um, blacks, and he immediately crushed that by uh, saying he was not black. He did the whole Obama thing. They, um, he went a little further than Obama, though, but he did the whole Obama thing, and um, black folks were all proud of his, his accomplishments and whatnot, and next thing you know, he tells them, I'm not black, I'm Cabo Asian. And black folks was like, what the heck is that? <laughs> and so he lost a lot of respect in the black community. And he was willing to give up that, um, that support, give up that loyalty that blacks had in order to try and uh, chase after some kind of acceptance from whites. And it has, you know, he made a lot of money, but in the end, it cost him. You know, and it, they keep doing the same thing over and over again. And you know that, you know, it's definitely uh, insanity. And so 
You know, we look at the different things that blacks are promoting. You got uh, black comedians that seem like they cannot uh, do a show without uh, cursing like a sailor, jumping around like a buffoon, and you know, uh, talking about black folks like they some kind of sambo, and you know it's. Uh, I had somebody that was talking about the Martin, how long it's been since Martin Lawrence did a, a, a stand-up comedy show and how they didn't uh, too much care for the Martin comedy show after it, you know, got the, uh, Martin started dressing as a transvestite, Shanae uh, They were saying, you know, but they still... Uh, thought at least his comedy show would be good, but he ended up uh, trying to be so much like Richard Pryor and um, seemed like Eddie Murphy trying so hard to be like Richard Pryor, and Richard Pryor was not something that you, a black male, should want to aspire to be. I mean, Richard Pryor liked uh, Oprah Winfrey, not to the same level, but he promoted white support supremacy and black inferiority uh, like it was going out of style. And, you know, he, he talked about black people like he was wearing a sheet and hood. And it became a thing of, um, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't really laugh at the stuff that he was saying because it was so disrespectful, derogatory, and insulting that you basically just, uh, as a black person, turned it off and uh, left him to his uh, pretend white world. And, of course, many of these comedians, they talked about uh, the comedian Dave Chappelle, and he did does a show trying to be like Richard Pryor, you know, cursing like a sailor, doing skits like he, you know, crazy as a loon, and... You know, always talking about these their white wives, and you know, and it, they, you see them promoting the idea that black women are not good enough for them. You're a black man now. If you are a black man and you feel that black women are not good enough for you, then there is something that you don't like about being a black man. And, you know, that's, that shows that you are an inferior person because no black man in his right mind would condemn someone who looks just like him unless he is mentally ill and does not like what he sees in the mirror. So I said I was going to uh, give you a couple of um things to help you understand what we're talking about. This one that I'm going to um, that I'm going to give you before we wrap up the, the series and wrap up the, the last of the show for this series. Uh, let's see if I can find it here. I always have to um, try to set them up so I can get back to them. But once it reaches um, the page drops. It's hard to get back to it, but let's see if I can find it. But you know, what you're basically what we're talking about is um, when you look at the devastation in the black community, and you see um, the different things going on with the children and with black men and black women and whatnot. Um, that is a direct response, that is a direct correlation to uh, the whole um, image that black folks have of themselves. And part of that image comes from uh, the things that they see in black entertainment. And we know that black entertainers have a huge problem one with just being black, and uh, of course a huge problem with uh, being proud and promoting that blackness as something to be proud of 
and you know, not for it to be uncompromising. Uh, the the things that if you want a black person to a uh, black entertainer or a black athlete to uh, sell out their image of themselves or um, become, you know, a buffoonery or anything. All you have to do is add a zero. That's the that was the running thing in the rap industry. If you want us to do something more uh, derogatory to ourselves, uh, to our people, um, to our image, all you have to do is add a zero. <laughs> I mean, when you look at it, it is absolutely true. I mean, you see them, and they make enough to live comfortably. And then, next thing you know, they they're trying to be, you know, bigger and better than the last person. And sure enough, they will. Uh, I'm not finding this one here. Oh, here we go. Um, sure enough, you will see them without fail. Uh, they will start doing more and more uh, derogatory things for to themselves, even calling themselves uh, names and you know different derogatory terms. And now you wonder what kind of mentality would make a black entertainer and disrespect even his mother. You used to um, them with fighting words when you try to when a person. Uh, disrespected a black male's mother and now he's up there talking crazy about his mother and his girlfriend and his wife and his his child and his you know his family it's ridiculous this one is called our brothers left our village because they didn't like what they saw my brothers left our village because they didn't like what they saw in the mirror when they face themselves and the skin covering their jaw. The, they rubbed their hands straight down their face and said their skin was just too dark. They, I'm going to have to open this up so I can see. Um, they saw their skin as unattractive, though it did not have a mark. They decided when time to find a girl, the ones in our village, they would not see. They set out to find a more attractive girl with light skin on her cheek. The light-skinned girls were pretty, with pretty hair is what they sought to find. We couldn't believe so many brothers in our village had lost their mind. Their skin was, so, was beautiful and so was ours. We came from the same tribe, but there was something about their melanin that they felt they had to hide. They, want, um, they went and made it with light-skinned girls in villages far away. And in their seas, their melanin gene began to fade away. Back during slavery, whites tried their best to whitewash all the blacks. Now here we are, our brothers doing the same because it's pride each of them lacks. Now we have some mixed-up tribes with chaos running wild. Every other species looks their uh, looks at their children, looks like their children, but these brothers look different from their child. Every culture goes to such great lengths to keep their bloodlines all intact, and the only fools that say love is blind are brothers who hate the fact that they're black. Okay, that's a Black Panther poem from 1974. I haven't read that one in a long time. <laughs> but um, I did that one when the whole um, integration thing was causing black men to lose their mind. And you had a bunch of black males at that time walking around in dashikis and uh, liberation colors. And then when you, when you saw them, uh, they were with white women. And, and then they had this thing about red bones. And um, you got these dark brothers that's talking about black power and all this good stuff. And every time you saw them, they were with a light-skinned black woman. 
Man, you know, if they were doing a movie, you had all these exploitation movies where uh, the you had these dark males, but all you saw in the movie were white and light-skinned females. And every now and then, you might see a uh, dark-skinned uh, female, um, black female with uh, afro, and she was usually, you know, by herself or portrayed as, um, you know, not good enough for this, uh, this black so-called pimp. And so and we, I wrote that one uh, when I was younger to help black males understand that their mind was gone and they needed a little help finding it back. And, you know, the thing is that given the opportunity, you know, just from, uh, birds, you you have black males that are very attracted to black females. It's only when they're birth, they're bombarded with these images of in order to be successful, you have to uh, get away from your blackness. In order to be successful, you need to be with this kind of um, woman in order for your children uh, to. You know, you got black males that say they don't want their child to have nappy hair. Well, that's that's a image problem. That's a problem within yourself. That means that you see your hair as inferior, and you see this uh, so-called um, white woman's hair as superior. And so you want your children to be less inferior than you are, and more superior, like this white woman. Same thing with the black women. Um, you got black female entertainers. I know uh, Tina Turner. I know she went through a lot with a black man, but you don't see uh, uh, Asian whites saying, you know, Asian men then treated me badly, so I'm going to only date a uh, black man. <laughs> you know, you, they, that's, even if that is something that they may feel, that is not something that you see them uh, promoting and, and uh, perpetrating uh, against their people. And, you know, the only time you see white females with black males, it, you, you, it looks really weird. And at any time she knows she can go uh, back to a, a white male and, and hopefully um, be able to find her mind and get uh, back to her whiteness, but black males are usually messed up for life and move from one white female to another white female and never uh, seem to go um, find their mind and uh, get back to their blackness. So we hope you enjoyed the series, and uh, we know we're going to get a lot of discussion about black entertainers and their promotion of mental illness, but we got to deal with it. So um, for those of you that have seen the, the promo that we put up for the new series, which is the Lynched in America series, uh, we will be explaining the series to you in the next show, and we will begin that series. Now, that series will take us. Uh, through the end of the year and into the new year. So we have a lot to discuss in that particular um, series. But we thank you so much for joining us for this one. And um, for those that uh, want to get a hold of the poems, you know you can go to BACA Berry uh, or DYCTB and um, each uh, time we'll put up the next Lynched in America series. That is, it won't be in order like the one, the series we just did. The, each show will be about a different lynching, a different type of lynching. And we're not talking about just the swinging from the tree lynching. We're talking about the lynching of the black mind in a lot of different uh, areas. So, like I said, we thank you so much for joining us for. Uh, the series, the different series leading up to this one, 
and we hope you enjoy the new one that's coming. We know we're going to get a lot of feedback for that one. But in the meantime, we say to you, as we always do, and all power to the people.